Uh, so it should be uh, enabled now. Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, I, I cannot read the chat while I'm talking. It's just because I'm sharing uh, full screen. Maybe in the next um, lectures, I'll try to fix it. Okay, now I'm, I'm recording. So I was saying that, uh, um, are, can, can we feel, let's say, safe in using this uh, AI or ML technologies, or are there any drawbacks with, with them? And uh, let's say to make a long story short, the, the, the answer is no. Uh, there are um, a number of issues that we should address before, before you know, feeling comfortable uh, in using this and secure in using this, uh, this technology. In this course, we will see some of them, um, and then I will mention maybe uh, some others um, by the end of this, uh, of this set of slides. Anyway, just to start with, uh, here, here you have an example. I think in 2011 or 2012, uh, the iPhone 5 uh, were released, was released. And, and this 5S, uh, I think it was the first uh, using the fingerprint reader for uh, unlocking the device and authenticating yourself. Now we have uh, also face recognition and face and fingerprint, let's say, are, are mostly used. But and this, of course, uses uh, to some extent machine learning to do the recognition process. Nowadays, for instance, uh, Face ID from Apple uses um, um, stores your templates, so the template of your face with this depth map also um, as a represent in the representation space of a, of a deep neural net. So you have like your template is encoded as a set of features, and then it's just matched. Uh, with the current instance that you that you um, provide to authenticate yourself, and if the match is uh, reasonably successful, then you are authenticated. Um, and as soon as this uh, fingerprint reader was released in this iPhone, uh, it was immediately hacked by a German uh, um, hacking club, which is called the Chaos Computer Club. So this was uh, actually 2013. Uh, okay, and you see here that um, they were able to um, unlock a device um, owned by a different user. And they did that by basically crafting fake fingerprints um, built with plastic materials. So you can take a latent fingerprint, as you see here, and then you can, from that, you can create a fake fingerprint like the ones that you see here, or even just using a silicon um, um, thin, of, of material and then you can apply it on top of your uh, fingerprint finger and then use it to authenticate yourself if you don't want to build a 3d um, finger and this is something that um, one colleague of mine here in the laboratory has been doing for uh, for years and, and they also host a competition which is called lead that um, if you're interested in you, you can check it but so this this was just an example to, to show that uh, one can trick let's say, the recognition system by applying this kind of trick um, using, using these fake fingerprints. And there are other examples as well. Um, at this point, one may say, OK, but then, uh, and, and I heard this sentence in, in, in some conferences. So people claim that, uh, you know, this is a problem just with the uh, old shallow, uh, sorry, well, once we got a review where they, uh, uh, said uh, these are primitive methods, okay? <laughs> like, and this embed uh, in their mind uh, support machines, random forests, and all these, uh, um, let's say, machine learning algorithms which are not neural networks. And so people may tend to say, okay, but this is a problem that you have with classical machine learning algorithms. Uh, for deep learning, it, it's different. And what actually turned out is that for deep learning, is even worse. Um, so in some cases, you can actually trick a deep learning algorithm by doing very, um, let's say, small perturbations to the input data. And this is something that was discovered um, independently from, from the work that we did by Google Brain. Um, so what these people from Google Brain showed, and this included uh, Christian Zajedi and probably, you know, uh, Young Goodfellow, what they found is that if you start from a, an image, let's say of a school bus, which is correctly classified by your classifier, by your deep neural network. For example, here you can take, I don't know, AlexNet or ResNet 18 or whatever uh, model you prefer trained on ImageNet, and you will get a very accurate classification. 
So school bus with confidence level or probability uh, 94%. So if you take, uh, for instance, this example, which is uh, classified, as, uh, as I said, with high confidence by the, by the network, what they show is that you can actually craft a small perturbation here. Uh, so here, this is magnified for the sake of visibility, but it's multiplied by a small number epsilon. So that when you add it on the, on, to the original image, what you get is roughly the same, uh, that only has uh, this um, um, small, let's say, uh, texture on top. Uh, but now this time it's misclassified as an ostrich with 97% confidence. So you can actually have uh, roughly the same image to arrive, but have it misclassified as something very different uh, for the classifier with high confidence. And uh, this was something um, that was discovered in this work, this very um, popular paper, Intriguing Properties of uh, uh, Neural Networks. And the way they craft this perturbation is actually using, again, the gradient of the algorithm that you are attacking, which is something that uh, I and some colleagues did one year before them in, in some different applications. And I, I will tell you uh, the story. Um, just for completeness uh, later on, and we, along with giving you more detail on how to craft uh, this specific perturbation. So this is uh, just for the time being, this is not random, okay? So this is a special kind of noise, which is crafted to bypass this specific model that you are attacking. So here you are assuming that the attacker can have complete access to the model. And given the weights, uh, the configuration, the architecture, then he knows how to craft this, this special kind of noise. Okay, here I have some more details on how the process work. And uh, ironically, this follows the same mechanism that you use to train the algorithm. So we have discussed before that to train machine learning, you need to do gradient descent on your data right, to minimize the loss function. So the underlying idea uh, to craft this adversarial perturbation is actually the same, but rather than minimizing the error on some samples, you would like to maximize it, maximize it, the probability of making a mistake, which is again expressed as a loss function. So here, rather than minimizing the loss with respect to the classifier parameters, what I'm doing is maximizing the, lo the loss, for instance, to have this parrot misclassified as something else, um, but I'm not changing the weights in this case, I'm changing the pixel pixels of the image, of the, of the input image, and therefore, if I state this problem, as you see here, now the simple, the simplest algorithm that you can use to solve this problem is just, again, gradient descent. And this is uh, what we showed in a couple of papers and also what uh, Zajedi and the others did uh, to craft this adversarial noise. And now if you take the derivative of this function, you would get an image which looks like this, which is exactly your perturbation. And then you can apply it to the input image and repeat the process to if in case you want to refine and, and reach convergence. And, and as you see here, once you add the noise to the input image, then this is misclassified as something different. And you can actually pick the class that you prefer and uh, and you, you would get a different kind of noise, but essentially the thing here is that the attacker can arbitrarily choose um, in which class you want to have something misclassified. Um, yeah, so this is a very simple explanation. Then we will see some more uh, details later on. And now one may also again argue that, okay, you show that this is not just a problem of old machine learning algorithms, it is also a problem for deep learning, but then this may be only something specific to images. And again, here the answer is no, this is like pervasive in all domains. And you can see different examples that have been uh, um, crafted in, in different applications. For example, here, it's still related to images, but not uh, just in the digital domain. So here, um, these, these researchers from, I think, Berkeley, uh, it's Acolt and Don Song, if I'm not wrong. Uh, what they did is to craft these uh, stickers that you see here on the left, so that once you apply these stickers to this stop sign, you can trick the traffic recognition system uh, which is implemented on board of this vehicle. So now they here, they just use the camera with the algorithm, but you, you would see the predictions on, uh, on the bottom. And what you will see is 
on the left that the stop sign is consistently misclassified as a speed limit, whereas on the right it's correctly classified. Okay, so I'm now playing the video. And you see that for most of the frames, on the left, the stop sign is misclassified, uh, with the exception of a couple of uh, frames. Um, because here, you, so the noise is not just crafted on a single frame of the image, but it is optimized across multiple, multiple frames, multiple views of the same uh, object. Uh, we will see more about this uh, tomorrow. But this is just to give you an idea that the, the attacks are said to transfer also to the physical world. So you can actually build objects that trick uh, these systems. And uh, here it's, it's another example. So you have uh, this gentleman here, which is, who is uh, Lu, Luyo Bauer. And uh, what they show in this paper with, with uh, Sharif and the others is that you can craft special eyeglasses glass frames, as you see here, uh, with these fancy colors to impersonate mostly, let's say, a celebrity, because they train the network to recognize celebrities. And in this case, uh, uh, Lujo is misclassified as Mila Jovovich, which I think is a very uh, bad error for the system anyway. Um, and this is an example. And again, depending on how you decide to craft this um, special pattern on this eyeglass frame, you can impersonate a different uh, actor or a different uh, um, celebrity. And again, this is actually fabricated. So uh, it's something that you can build and uh, print um, in, in, in reality. It's not just a digital attack. Um, here you have another example of attack in the physical space where uh, this time uh, An uh, Anisha Tali and Nicola Scarlini um, build this 3D object. So initially you have this 3D turtle, uh, which is correctly recognized as a turtle for most of the frames. But then they print this uh, 3D turtle with this uh, fancy pattern on the, on the top, as you see here. And this is consistently classified as a rifle from different angles and perspectives. Uh, even though, I mean, to a human, it seems still uh, a turtle, right? There is something weird in the color, but um, that's, that's still a turtle for us. So these are just examples of attacks in the um, physical space. We ourselves uh, did some experiments as well on this um, um, robot vision system from iCub. So for those of you that don't know it, uh, iCub is um, a humanoid robot from the Italian Institute of Technology, uh, the IIT. And uh, um, to recognize objects, as you see in the picture, it uses essentially um, a deep neural network. So it acquires an image. So there is a tracking uh, mechanism, actually, that uh, detects movement and then crops the image, as you see in the picture. So if something moves, then the uh, robot focuses his attention on, on that specific part of the image, and, and you have a snapshot of this um, bunch of pixels. They are processed by um, a deep neural network trained on ImageNet. In this case, uh, this is AlexNet. And then what they do is they only retrain the last layer to recognize these objects, which can be uh, cup, sponge, detergent, plates, these are normally uh, objects that you use at home. Uh, because in this case, the task was to help people uh, at home doing some uh, um, tasks uh, for, for, for your daily you know, uh, life. And so um, this is basically how it works. And um, of course, you can attack this um, in the standard setting by you know, uh, changing the pixels of the input image. But you can also craft something in the physical world, for instance, what we did was to design these, uh, to optimize these stickers. And then when you apply this specific sticker to an object, it's mis misclassified as a sponge. So this is a cup misclassified as a sponge. If you apply this other sticker, it's misclassified as a laundry detergent. And uh, basically, you can build a sticker for each target class if you want. And here we also have uh, a small demo where you see that the classification changes as soon as you apply let's say, this small uh, piece of paper, this small sticker to the, to the object. 
Uh, here you have uh, the sponge one, and you can see the probabilities on the left. So these are the, how the this is how the prediction uh, changes across time. Okay, so that's uh, just an example of application of these uh, attacks. Okay, so again, um, this does not only happen for images and does not only happen in the physical world, you can do a lot of things in other applications as well. Um, here, what I'm showing you is an example of speech recognition, which was developed by Nicola Scarlini again. Um, and here, um, they were attacking a text to a speech, uh, sorry, a speech to text system, so a transcription system, basically that starts from an audio signal and gives you a transcription as output of what the, you know, the, like the subtitles in movies. And then uh, uh, what you will, what you are going to hear, hopefully, uh, is the clean sentence at the beginning and the corresponding transcription. So now I'm going to play it. If you don't hear anything, just tell me and we'll try to arrange uh, some, but you should be able to hear it. Without the data set, the article is useless. Okay, I hope you heard it, and the transcription uh, is the following. So I guess you all agree that uh, this is what we heard in this uh, sentence. Now, what I'm going to play is essentially the same audio, which has been slightly perturbed by the authors of this paper um, to be transcribed as something different. Without the data set, the article is useless. So you probably heard the same sentence with a small background noise in the background if you have a very good hearing system, uh, which is not compromised by <laughs> loud music. Uh, in this case, what the algorithm transcribes is actually, okay, Google browse to evil.com, which means, okay, basically <laughs> you ask Alexa to connect or Google Home to connect to a malicious website, for instance. And this, this, this is very subtle because uh, uh, maybe it's uh, an audio that you can uh, play in some speakers and actually you don't hear yourself anything malicious, but the, um, the, the tool that you have, the device that you have uh, may, I don't know, buy something on Amazon or connect to some malicious website and being infected by malware uh, while you don't spot the message. So that's uh, again an example of attack. And there, there, I think there are even cases, there was an interesting paper, just, just to mention, at uh, CCS, which is uh, a, a conference on computer security. Uh, it was about, uh, I think it was called Dolphin Attack. So if you're interested, you can Google for that and you find it. And uh, in that case, they were even able to um, send an audio, which was not audible by humans, so we, we couldn't hear anything but it was anyway uh, perceived by the machine. So by the, the device was actually receiving a command while you cannot hear anything. Uh, but this was not actually targeting any machine learning algorithm. It was just tricking uh, the mic um, using some, some frequency uh, mirroring technique. But, but it, it's anyway uh, very interesting. I think you can, uh, can have a look in case. All right, so there's images, there's audio, and there's also malware. So in, 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 uh, in the case of uh, Windows malware or in computer viruses, what uh, we and others have shown is that you can actually modify the source code of the malware, or let's say the binary code of the, of the malware, malware uh, sample in a way that it tricks um, machine learning algorithms that make detection. In particular, one of the most targeted models is this uh, Malconf in, in this space because it's a convolutional uh, deep neural network that, was, uh, that has been recently published by a researcher from, uh, from the US, uh, Edward Ruff. And it's actually one of the few models that are available uh, for the community to play with. And uh, what, what Edward was showing is that you can build uh, a convolutional network that learns directly from the raw bytes uh, to discriminate legitimate and malicious files. So I'm talking about Windows programs here. So you have these X uh, files. And we thought this was a very bad idea because we knew already that images have these problems, especially when you use convolutional networks. Um, 
And so we started as, as a game, actually, on, on, on Twitter. We, we replied to Edward and, and we said, and I, and I, and I said to him, uh, I, I think this is really vulnerable to, you know, a careful injection of bytes in the program. And they say, no, but, you know, this is not like images. It may be robust. And then we accepted the challenge and we published the paper that you, that you see below, where we basically show that you can, if you add padding bytes at the end of the file, so um, this is after the end of file. Um, you can plug in some additional uh, bytes, which would not compromise the execution of the program because they are just appended at the end. So it's bogus content in the end, which is never executed uh, when you run the program, but actually is used by the network to make the decision because the network doesn't know which parts of the program will be executed, in which order. This is just like doing static analysis on the program. And it, it's, it's even less informed in a sense because you just use the sequence of bytes. And um, what happened is that uh, by actually injecting very few bytes, as you see here, this is 10 uh, kilobytes roughly, we were able to evade uh, the classifier with more than 60%. And this is just the first naive attack that, then, that we crafted. And uh, Luca will be talking tomorrow about more complex modifications that you can do to executable files. Uh, that cause um, essentially much larger damage to this classifier. So this was just to witness that um, we should not really rely on, uh, on, on simple networks uh, without exploiting the structure of the, and the semantics of the program to, to make a decision. And uh, this is basically the blue, uh, the blue curve is what we did. So, here you see the probability of evading the classifier as a function of the number of bytes that you append at the end. And this grows uh, quite fast. Uh, keep also into consideration that 10 kilobytes is a very small um, payload because in this case, the network was trained based on two megabytes of data as input. So this is less than 1% of the file eventually that you, that you modify. And uh, even if you add random bytes, as you see here, so this is the distribution of the bytes that we add uh, at the end of the malware samples. Even if you add random bytes, you have some chances of uh, evading detection. I think because mostly you are increasing the size of the malware sample and typically legitimate samples are larger in size. So this, you know, the number of bytes is already by itself an indication of um, how likely the sample is, is looking benign. Um, but the nice thing is that if you optimize this injection of bytes, so if you carefully select these bytes to be injected using essentially looking at the gradient of the function, then what you find is that mostly you inject always the same bytes and these have a much uh, larger impact on the classification function. So as you see here, all right. So, and, and this is a problem which is common to many different systems, not just uh, Windows malware. So if you want, you can have a look in the, in the executable space of uh, Windows malware. We did a bunch of, of, of papers, and these are also very recent. And there is also a library that you can play with uh, to generate these malicious samples. Um, this is a tool that is also um, going to be incorporated in, uh, in Counterfeit, which is uh, uh, a tool developed by, by Microsoft Research. And but this, I think, uh, Luca will say more about this. Um, but we and others did a lot of work also in other malware domains, like uh, PDF malware cases. And uh, this was actually the first domain that we investigated, um, where the goal of, of the machine learning model was to detect the presence of computer viruses embedded within a PDF file. Because PDF uh, files are basically a container where you can inject uh, essentially whatever you want. You can put videos in, you can put images, you can put uh, even scripts, right? And then if you, if you can add a script into a container, then this could be malicious, of course. You, you can have a JavaScript embedded into a PDF file that performs some malicious actions. And this is exactly what happened around 2013, 2018. Um, and so this was quite interest as a use case for uh, adversarial machine learning. And then uh, we did also a lot of work uh, uh, on Android malware as well as other people. Um, now, of course, here it's a bit more challenging to craft the actual malware, malware examples because you don't just need to, you know, change the value of a pixel. 
uh, as you do in images or add some noise to a waveform for audio. Here, you should consider manipulations of these files, which preserve functionality while evading detection. And this is much harder than you know, working with other type of data, which can be manipulated more easily. Um, and in fact, if you want to dig a bit deeper into this problem, you can have a look at this uh, nice paper by uh, Fabio Pierazzi, Lorenzo Cavallaro, and other people from uh, um, King's College and, and UCL now. And so I'm, I'm recommending you to read, uh, have a look at this paper. Um, all right, so let me see what we have here. Okay, so the, the first take home message uh, for today is that despite, you know, uh, although we are living exciting time for machine learning, so we have uh, um, these techniques have recorded unprecedented success in many different applications. And this work feeds a lot of consumer technologies. And, and you know, we have uh, these algorithms on our, all devices, uh, even on smart houses, smart homes, um, televisions, or well, I don't know, how many devices, maybe also in your fridge, you may have one. Um, and while this opens up new big possibilities and facilitates the usual tasks that we perform every day, there are a lot of security risks that are associated to these um, new functionalities. And this is like a dogma in security. So the more functionalities you have, the more you are exposing what, what we call a larger attack surface. So you are exposing more potential vulnerabilities. Um, there was... Uh, a, a, a small anecdote that I like uh, that I made in some previous talks and then we, we will have a break. Um, just talking about uh, smart uh, fridges, I remember that there was a case where, uh, so the fridge was connected to the internet because um, the owner was informed, for instance, if, I don't know, uh, there was uh, no more yogurt, for instance, or the beer was finished. And then uh, he wanted to receive uh, an alert on his phone saying, hey, look, if you come home together, uh, home tonight, then uh, there will be no beer in the fridge. And then uh, the user was expected to go to the supermarket, buy some beers, and then uh, to be happy eventually. Uh, so to have this functionality, the fridge is connected to the internet. And many of these uh, IoT devices uh, are actually connected, but they, they have a lot of vulnerabilities because it's difficult to protect this kind of hardware, these embedded platforms, um, given their limited computational power and so on and so, and so forth. But again, to make a long story short, the fridge was compromised by a malware, um, by I think a, a malware campaign or, you know, or some of these malware um, that, that are going around uh, on the, over the internet. So this was compromised and it became part of a botnet and then uh, it turned out that the fridge was actually banned from internet because it was sending spam emails across the US for, I don't know, it's been doing that for, for a lot of days. And then it was um, stopped. Just to give you an idea of what may happen if you expose new functionalities uh, on the web. All right, I think I've been talking for roughly an hour now, so we can uh, uh, have a break. Let's say we do uh, 10 minutes. If you have questions, feel free to um, write them in the chat or ask anything if you like. So I'm just staying here maybe five seconds in case you have any questions or curiosities, and then we can have the break, okay? Okay, so I have um, I just a communication um, to tell you. Magari la dico in italiano, tanto insomma non interessa. Okay. Eh, le avevo detto che doveva essere una conferenza no? questa settimana e che quindi non avevo potuto frequentare in realtà non sarà la conferenza perché mi sono detto il menisco e, la prossima settimana ho l'operazione mercoledì quindi non, cioè, è dei hospital non dovrebbe impegnare particolarmente e dovrei anche riuscire a seguire la lezione di mercoledì stesso insomma se no la seguo comunque, seguo comunque la registrazione sì, e va bene. la voglio avvisare perché non so in realtà come, cioè, come si svolgerà qu quanta tempistica mi prenderà ecco tutto qui no ma non è, non è un problema in generale non, so, in generale you don't have the 
um, I'm not keeping track of who is present or not. So you feel free not to follow the course if you can't. I will uh, hopefully not forget to, you know, I will, I will remember the lecture so that you can uh, you can look at it later. And um, yeah, don't I mean, don't worry. It's it's, okay. uh, it's more a, a seminar than a course in the end. So. Okay, thanks. All right. OK, so let's have a short break, uh, 10 minutes, then I will start again at 10, 10, 13. OK. All right, see you in a moment.
professor.
Okay, I'm back. I, I was adding uh, some people that uh, uh, apparently uh, were not able to access the group. Um, yeah, my prof uh, professor, my colleague cannot connect. I sent you in the chat her uh, email. Okay, okay. I, I've added her with the um, student account. Can, can you check if uh, she's able to access now? Okay. And maybe as as we solve this, we can uh, we can keep going. She's trying. Okay, good. Thanks, because then uh, I don't have any other uh, requests. I'm, I'm sorry about this, but uh, Teams seems to have uh, uh, to let only access people from the University of Cagliari. So I needed to add uh, people from CNA one, one by one. And sometimes um, probably some of these uh, skipped. Um, not sure if I skipped them. I don't think so. I think uh, the system uh, either didn't, didn't invite them properly because um, I was keeping track of the people that I added, and I added most of them. Uh, uh, I think now she's connected, so... Okay, so. okay, that's good. Uh, thank you. Okay, let's go back uh, to the presentation. Uh, so let me screen share. Again, this one. Okay. All right, now you should be able to see the presentation again. Okay, so we've been talking about um, security risks um, of, machine, of using machine learning models in different applications. In particular, uh, we've mostly discussed attacks that one can stage against a trained system which is deployed, let's say, at test time. So you have a system which is working uh, based on machine learning and you uh, attack it. So you try to, for instance, evade detection or have some samples misclassified as something different. Uh, so now, uh, in the next slides, I will talk about why this is possible. So why are these behaviors um, expected to happen for machine learning, okay? So in the classical model uh, that underlies this, um, um, let's say, machine learning theory, uh, what you have is the following setup that you see depicted here. So you have a you have, uh, data source that generates the data, um, so the raw data. And this could be, for example, um, um, I don't know, a, a text that you have, a piece of paper with, with printed characters, or, I don't know, a source of the, the nature which generates images, um, of animals, people, objects, and so on. Then you have a phase where this uh, data is acquired um, through the process of measurement. You extract some measures from data. For example, in this case of OCR, you scan the text that you have printed uh, in paper. And this may have different um, artifacts caused by Maybe, I don't know, there is a noise in the acquisition process or the scanner uh, has some dust on top of it. Or, you know, th there are some artifacts which are due intrinsically to how the, pro the process of measuring things or acquiring things is performed. And this noise is uh, stochastic. So it's, it's a random noise, essentially. After that, uh, from the, the data that you acquired, you extract the feature vector. So you extract some measurements which you use to um, learn a model, which is then deployed to classify new things. And here, um, it basically, you extract uh, the kind of characters that you would like to have, and then the classifier will recognize uh, that this is an S, that you have an E, a T, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> now, here, what you have is that there are basically two implicit assumptions behind this model. One is that, um, this data source is given and it does not depend on the classifiers. Typically, it is natural in general. And then the other assumption, so this other cloud that you have here, 
is that the noise uh, which is applied during the process of acquiring data is completely random. And in particular, again, it does not depend on what you have afterwards in, in this cascade. So it does not depend on the feature vector, on the learning algorithm, on the classifier, and so on and so forth. So these two clouds, let's say, are independent from the learning algorithm and the classifier. And now the question is, can we use, uh, can we rely on these assumptions when the system is used in an adversarial setting? So where you have maybe a malicious user that is trying to evade detection, for instance. So I'm, I'm the hacker manipulating malware samples in a way that they are no longer detected as malware, but rather as legitimate. So can we rely on this assumption in this case? Of course, the answer here is fairly simple. And the answer is no, you, you, you should not rely on this assumption that the data source and the stochastic noise are independent for the, from the classifier, because this is exactly what happens in this case, in the adversarial setting case. And uh, just to um, exemplify this process, um, we can consider the problem of uh, spam filtering, um, which is basically a text classification problem. Um, at least there is a component in most of these uh, spam filters, which is a text classifier. Then you have a bunch of other modules that, for instance, look at the provenance of the email, for instance. So you check which servers the email uh, went through before reaching destination, um, and, and so on and so forth. Oh, sorry, I, I have to uh, charge. Why it doesn't work? Just give me a second, I have a, a battery problem. Okay, sorry, I solved it. Uh, the problem is my, my, my uh, power <laughs> plug is not working properly anyway. Now it should be fixed. Okay, so I was telling that um, you have this spam uh, filter, filters that most, um, many of them contain a text classifier among other modules. Uh, for instance, if you look at spam assassin, uh, this is actually the case. Bogo filter has uh, pretty much the same structure, and I, I guess there are a bunch of others that. Uh, use the same uh, architecture. So let's say one uh, subset of the components of these uh, large filters is a text classifier. So, and by tricking the, the text classifier, you can have your emails misclassified as your spam emails as an attacker misclassified as legitimate. So for example, um, this work, uh, this, this classifier works in a very simple way. Um, so text classifiers are normally for this case, linear, uh, because you have a huge vocabulary of words, which is which is built during training, and then on top of this, you learn a linear classifier. So typically, you have millions of features, where each feature is the presence or absence of a given word in your dictionary, and then um, each way, each word or each feature is weighted by a specific um, weight learned during training by the classifier, and then the, the final score is just the sum of these of the weights associated to the words which are contained in the cover in the current email. So now to make it, let's say, easier, if you look at this example, you have the text here by Viagra, and you see that uh, both words are in the dictionary of known words by the classifier, and these are the weights that you see uh, learned during training by the classifier. So for, for, for example, by was associated to the weight one, and Viagra was associated to the weight five. Of course, here I'm assuming that uh, positive, uh, the positive class is the malicious class, 
and that's why you have a positive weight here. So the more the weight is positive, the more the word is retained bad, a bad word. So a word which is mostly, let's say, appearing in spam emails, but not in legitimate ones. So that's roughly the intuition. Now, this email is scored by simply summing up these weights. So in this case, one plus five is six. And assuming that you have a threshold set to five to make a decision, if, which means if something is above five is spam, below it's legitimate. What you have here is that the score is six higher than five. So this email is correctly classified as a spam email. Okay, now this is very, very simple, but it's actually um, how they, this filter also works in practice. Okay, and as I said, there are a number of filters that um, really follow the same mechanism. So now the question here is, um, how can you evade this, this, um, this mechanism? Uh, but before that, there is this um, view in the feature space. Okay, this is just conceptually, but uh, assuming that you have features along your axis, so this is, that's the feature space. Now here, this could be, I don't know, uh, a word, and this could be another word. Um, and you can imagine that in the space of all these um, words, you have spam emails, uh, which, are, which can be clustered in some region, and legitimate emails, which can be clustered in some other region. And then what you have is that here, at some point, you have a, a linear classifier. So there's a linear function, a decision hyperplane that cuts the space into two halves, one of which is classified as spam and the, uh, and the other, uh, while the other is classified as legitimate. OK, so that's more or less a very simple distorted view of reality in this case, but um, just, just as a concept, just fix it in this way. So what you have here is that um, to, uh, during training, the classifier learns this function, which is uh, which amounts to giving a different weight to uh, the different words you have in the dictionary. So that's more or less the training process. And here is the assume. Uh, let's assume that this is this point specifically is the email that we have just considered with this by Viagra text. Okay. So now, if you want to, um, let's say, bypass detection in this case, so you are playing the role of the spammer now, your email has been detected, so you want to do something to circumvent detection uh, by your filter. But what you could do here uh, is, is apply a couple of tricks. Okay, now here we just exemplify one, which is called a good word injection, a good word injection attack. So you uh, as an attacker, you try to guess some of the good words which might be learned by, by the filter during training, by the classifier during training, and add them to your email. So as you see here, um, if the spammer knows that um, their emails is targeting mostly academic people, or I don't know, the people in business, then they may think that conference meeting is a bunch of legitimate words because this this would be something which is very common in legitimate emails and then as a spammer you can try to add these words if you do that uh, and these words are actually good words uh, they will end up decreasing the overall score of the classification of the classification function so in this case you will have six as a malicious contribution and then you will have five <clears throat> as a let's say the sum of benign contributions to this email and then overall um, this email is eventually classified as legitimate, so it bypasses detection. And this is actually a trick which is used by spammers very frequently, um, with the caveat that they are also painting the good words in white, so that most of the clients, uh, of, the, of the email clients, will not display the, word, um, the words automatically to the human eye, unless you either select the text or do some, something. But for most of the users, <clears throat> the good words will remain somehow hidden from the text. Okay, so that's an example. So in this case, you can actually evade detection quite easily. And what happens in the feature space view is that you see that your point, your, your initial sample was in some location in this space, but then what happened is that it moved and uh, it's, let's say, by, um, crossed the boundary and now ends up in the legitimate region. 
And, and so this is um, a clear example that the noise that is applied to the email is all but not random. Because in this case, uh, these words here are not taken at random between you know good and bad, bad words. They are chosen in a way that is taught to evade detection. So the noise is really targeting your classifier. You see that this arrow points towards the direction um, that at some point will cross the boundary that you have. OK, so again, going back to our question, is this model good for spam filtering? Of course, the answer is no, because now both the source of data and the noise are not random. So they are not, let's say, outside of uh, the control of, of, um, of, of, um, of, of, of the attacker. So it's not like nature and random noise. Now you have the attacker who is probably crafting the samples himself. So like he's preparing the content of the spam message, but then he, is also, he or she is also manipulating the, the text in a way that bypasses detection. So the source of the data is no longer neutral, but depends on the classifier and as well as the noise. The noise is not randomly applied to samples, but is applied in a way that causes damage to the classifier. So in this way, again, the noise is crafted to maximize the probability of error. So it's not a random noise. And again, here you have a, another example of how you can change the content of the email, for instance, or of the text to bypass detection while preserving readability for uh, the target users, so the, the victim of, of the spam or, uh, or the scam in this case. OK, so that's a very um, simple notion. And if you want, I mean, to, uh, if you want to make a small parallel uh, with something that you're probably familiar with, uh, more familiar with is this um, difference that you have between the noise model on um, telecommunication channels um, used by Shannon and the one used by Emming. So in the first case, by Shannon, you have basically a probabilistic model of noise, and the noise is essentially random, um, can randomly affect the bits that you send through the channel. Whereas in the model by Emming, this is a worst case noise. So the noise will be applied in the worst case for the receiver. So the, the bits that will be compromised are chosen among those that cause the, the maximum, let's say, the, the, um, the maximum probability of error for the receiver. And, and with that kind of an analysis, in this worst case setting, you can actually get some bounds on the performance of the of the receiver rather than studying the average performance. So that's mostly the difference between the classical setting and the adversarial setting. So in the classical setting for machine learning, we are guaranteeing performance on the average case, assuming that you know what, what we say is that the test data has to be representative or, or, the, or vice versa. The, the training and the test data come from the same distribution. So. Uh, you are assuming that the test data has some, only some slight variation with respect to the training set. Under this assumption, then you can guarantee some average level of performance. But clearly, if data is, is manipulated uh, or it changes over time, this performance cannot be longer guaranteed. So that's the kind of analysis uh, that we aim to make here as well. OK, and th that's why uh, the classical model cannot work in this case. Um, we, we already said that, that um, both the source of data and the noise are not random. And um, they are under the control of the attacker, which has, uh, who has a malicious intent against uh, the classifier. OK, um, and so it, it's easy to see. Uh, and then this is actually what happens in many cybersecurity tasks, that when you deploy a model, uh, after some time, some time the performance will drop, um, mostly because the data changes a lot over time. So this is, for instance, the case of uh, spam emails. So if you do not retrain your anti-spam frequently, then the performance, of course, will decrease, the, the, decrease over time. Um, the same happens if you monitor network traffic. For instance, if you uh, want to stop malware, uh, that abuses um, DNS services or something uh, like that, you need to keep track of uh, the domains which are contacted and so on and so forth. And, and this, of course, changes over time. So it's, it's very difficult. 
and the same is for malware. For example, for Android malware, you observe a lot of variations um, over time, not only because adversaries are, try to, are trying to fool malware detectors in general, but also because um, the underlying operating uh, system changes. For instance, Android is uh, often updated with new versions. And so, for instance, many of the API calls that you do to the system um, change name or they are somewhat deprecated. And so both, let's say, legitimate applications and malware applications need to be updated. And then again, you need to change your model because otherwise it doesn't work anymore. So. Um, of course, other if you are in, in, in the presence of a drift, which can be natural, adversarial, or whatever, you would need to retrain the model. Um, so you cannot guarantee the same level of performance that you have um, on static, on stationary data. Okay, is there any question at this point? Because now the next step is, uh, but then if we now know that the classical model cannot work in this case, how should we design these uh, learning algorithms, um, assuming that you have an attacker that may um, target them at test time? And so the, the key idea here is that you have to actually consider the, pre the presence of the attacker explicitly when you design the, the, the learning uh, algorithm. And what you normally have um, is an arms race between the attacker and the defender. And this is something that goes on in many, many tasks in, uh, in, in the security space. For, uh, so what happens typically is that as soon as you have a system in place uh, for which attackers have a clear incentive um, in bypassing them or you know, uh, compromising them for different reasons, then this system will be attacked with very high probability. And so what's gonna happen is that the attacker will analyze the defense that you have in place or the system that you put in place. And then at some point they will try to devise and execute an attack. Here, you, this is a very simplified um, chain for the attacker, but um, more or less it, it summarizes what, what happens. So you may have some infiltration steps uh, in between some escalation of privilege, but. Anyway, in, for machine learning, it's easier to think about um, getting information about the system that you want to attack and eventually actually trying to attack it. And on the other hand, uh, so looking from the designer perspective, when you receive new attacks that are effective against your system, uh, you have a drop, of course, in the performance level. Then what you need to do is analyze this attack and develop a countermeasure. And then this loop uh, goes on uh, ideally um, uh, you know, for, for, for a very long time, um, unless, let's say, there is some equilibrium or some incentives are now um, no longer existing for the attacker. And, and I want to give an example um, on, on which we worked um, back in, in 2004, 5, and so on, uh, which was related to the case of uh, image spam. So at some point, this was actually when I when I started my PhD uh, in 2006. We were working on this problem, and uh, what we saw was that at some point in time, starting from 2004, as, as it's uh, reported here, spammers and you you see these typical spam emails at that time. You have random words here which are mimicking this uh, um, good word injection attack, but then the real um, message, so the real spam message was embedded into these uh, images that you see here. So here you actually have the list of uh, um, uh, pharmacies that you can buy for a few dollars. And this was the actual um, goal of the email. And here as well, you have this sort of um, advertisement for these pills. So this is very interesting because now the, of course the text classifier is blind in front of this threat because um, it can no longer see any of these words in the email. It just sees a, a bunch of random words. And then normally these emails uh, were really able to bypass detection. And then the first step that um, my colleagues uh, did, uh, actually before I joined the lab, was to apply basically OCR, so optical character recognition, 
uh, on these spam images. So you take an email, you extract the images, you run optical character recognition on them, and then you process the text. And this was quite effective uh, in recognizing the spam message uh, embedded into the image. Uh, and of course, this was also coupled with the fact that uh, uh, there was also what is called a signature-based detection mechanism in place in many anti-spam filters, uh, which works reactively. So you assume that you are a user, you receive this email, and then you flag it as spam. Uh, then another user receives the same and flags it as spam. So as soon as you have uh, enough evidence that this email is actually spam, this image that you have can be blacklisted. So you can compute the hash for this image, for instance, using MD5 or whatever, and then this hash can be basically um, added to the filter and given a positive score. And, and that will increase uh, the probability that this email is eventually classified as spam. Okay, so there was, there was this possibility of embedding either OCR or signature-based mechanism, or both. And um, this was interesting because um, we also developed, they also developed a plugin for Spam Assassin, which was um, quite successful. So we had a couple of requests from um, administrators of um, spam filters actually deployed in some companies that were trying to uh, play with this tool. Of course, here the problem is that OCR is computationally intensive. So you cannot run it on all the spam that you receive. Uh, but on a small fraction of them, you, you could do something. But anyway, so this was uh, at the beginning. So the, there were these uh, spam emails with images embedded, and then you had this countermeasure uh, arising afterwards. So on the one hand, you have these signature-based mechanisms, plus the possibility of doing OCR of, uh, of the images to extract the content. And then again, if you think the arms race, what's the next step? The next step is to use, um, is to complicate the extraction of the text from images and also randomize the content to avoid uh, signature-based detection. Because um, if, even if you change a single pixel, then um, the signature of the image changes completely. So this uh, signature-based detection is really easy to be uh, defeated by just, you know, randomizing the creation of these images. And then uh, what we've uh, seen is um, the, the, the spam emails, the, the, sorry, the spam images started to embed text, which was uh, carved, colored in different uh, ways, um, put on more complicated backgrounds, or even have something that makes it much harder to read uh, from, 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 for a machine, right? So ironically, what we used to design CAPTCHAs uh, was used to actually defeat uh, the automatic, automated uh, detection methods. You know that CAPTCHAs are used to protect website, websites, um, essentially to prevent that bots create a huge number of accounts. For, for example, for Gmail, you can open up a free account whenever you want, but you're asked to solve a CAPTCHA to verify that you are a human and not a bot. So an automatic OCR tool cannot read or cannot solve the CAPTCHA, right? So that's the Turing test, basically. And um, the attackers in this case were creative enough to use the same technology to prevent defenses, right, from, from working in this case. Um, and this is the kind of spam that you uh, observed at that time. So this was around 2006, 2007. Um, and then at this point, OCR was no longer effective. So what we did was to develop a classifier that was looking at some specific characteristics of the image. In particular, we looked um, some of these features, for instance, that you see here. Uh, we detect the presence of uh, characters or text, which was obfuscated in some way. So here we no longer detected the exact content of the image. So that the text that was embedded there, but that the fact that you could have text potentially obfuscated, and that would be a, a potential sign of uh, uh, maliciousness. Then uh, there was, you know, another feature that was uh, aimed to detect uh, these fancy backgrounds. 
um, non-uniform backgrounds, hidden text, and so on and so forth. The number of colors uh, was another feature that we used, for instance. And we also developed a, a, a new plugin for again for spam assassin, which was called Image Cerberus. I don't know if I don't think this works anymore, but um, this was you know the last step of the uh, of the arms race. And then um, the volume of image spam have uh, has since declined, but I'm sure it's not because we developed this plugin. Okay, it's it's because the attackers were able to find uh, simpler ways which were less costly for them to still evade detection. Uh, so image spam was just a trend um, in this arms race, but uh, eventually uh, the volume of this um, threat or of this spam image uh, declined. All right, so again, this is uh, just to give you an example of uh, this arms race. And now the key idea, uh, which we described in the paper that you see there, is that you should, to, de to develop these adversary aware machine learning models or robust models, if you want, what you need to do is to put yourself into the shoes of the attacker. So now as a system designer, you should try to proactively anticipate what an attacker could do to break your system and actually test if this is the case or not. So in, in, as you see here now, as a system designer, I want to play the red team. How is it called in, uh, in companies? There's the red team and the blue team. So the red team is attacking the system. So the first thing that you need to do as a red team member is to have a model of the attacker. So what could be the attacker incentives, what he or she may know about the system, how he or she can manipulate data, and so on and so forth. So the first thing to do is to have a model of the attacker to understand which kind of threats are more likely to happen against your system. And then, based on the model that you developed, you can try to simulate different attacks, which have to be, of course, uh, credible threats against your system. And then you can go back and play the, with the blue team uh, hat. You can again play the defender role, evaluate if the attack has a substantial impact on your system, if it's worth uh, developing a countermeasure, and if you know how to do that, then you, then you should. And, and that's basically the cycle. Of course, some of these threats may also not be uh, patched in any way. And, and so again, here you need to make a more strategic decision on what to do. Uh, but we will see some more detailed examples. So now this is just to fix the concept of the arms race and that you need to proactively try to imagine which possible attacks um, your system can incur at test time or during operation. And again, here we should also consider that there, while there are threats which are obvious and that you can model very easily, there are threats you cannot envision in advance because the attacker might, might be smarter than you or there may be anyway things that um, you don't know that that are going to happen and then you have to be prepared in a sense also to account for this possibility um, but we will see uh, some example uh, of that as well all right so the the three rules uh, in this case for designing um, let's say adversary aware learning models are stated here with these um, fancy titles in a way so the first one is know your adversary. And this is concerning the work that you should do to model the attacker and understand threats that may be targeted to your, to your machine learning or AI system. Be proactive is the, um, let's say, implementation of the actual attack. So you try to put yourself into the attacker's shoes and develop attack yourself, develop attacks yourself, test how your system uh, withstands or not against them, and then eventually come up with techniques to defend your classifier against these threats. So these are the three main rules uh, which will follow um, in this uh, course, basically. So now in the, let's say, last hour, I will try to um, discuss how to model the attacker. And then uh, we will make some examples of, uh, again, how you can proactively uh, design the attacks. And I will end up by saying, OK, these are the threats that one can have against uh, learning systems. 
And in the upcoming lectures, you will see that um, you can have evasion attacks, that there are certain category of attacks, and how to defend them. So you, you will be working on points two and three here, both attacking and defending your system. Okay, so that's the plan. Uh, let, let's keep going for, uh, I don't know, other maybe 10 minutes, and then we can have another short break. All right, are, are there any questions so far? Is everything clear? Can you type a yes or no maybe in the chat? If I'm going too slow, too fast, uh, what, what, what's your thought? Okay. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, so let's continue. So uh, this part is, uh, let's say, Again, maybe a bit boring, but it's uh, mostly threat modeling, which is something which is not really fun overall. But this is how you should, uh, let's say, do uh, a due diligence to check uh, all the potential open doors in your in your in your system for the attacker. So now let's see um, how we did this um, threat modeling part for uh, machine learning systems at the general level. Then, of course. Depending on the specific application, you could look into more specific features of the problem. But at a very high level, uh, what we are doing now is establishing a general threat model for uh, AI and machine learning models. And so the, the model that we consider after, you know, reading a lot of papers in the space. And so all, all the things that I'm discussing now are uh, previews to the, the recent work that you see now on deep learning, uh, on attacking deep learning or defending deep learning uh, from 2014 and beyond, all the things that I discussed here are uh, contained in work which was done before that date. Um, in particular, work by uh, people that were working on this from uh, UC Berkeley. Um, people that were working on this uh, from Germany and uh, we were working on this from uh, from uh, from Italy. So this is mostly uh, work done in, 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 in that space. Um, in particular, there, there was already some uh, attacker model in a couple of papers, but then we sort of uh, make it much more systematic by complementing some dimensions. And the summary of all this literature and, 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 and stuff around is uh, what you see in the in the next slides, and, and um, then I can give you some pointers if you want to go uh, and look at the say more mathematical details on how you can uh, formalize uh, this model as well. So here I'm just giving a qualitative description of the model, but then you can also formalize it in a in a quite elegant way, I think, um, and that's in the papers. <clears throat> okay, so the how do you model the attacker in this case? Um, what is, let's say, what has been consolidated from, uh, from the literature is that you can have this uh, 3D model for the attacker. So you should um, discuss what is the goal uh, of the attacker, what the, let's say, uh, their ability in manipulating data is, and what they know about the system. So it's goal, knowledge, and capability, eventually. And then in the next slides, I will detail all these three dimensions for the model. So in the, in the, goal, um, the goal of the attacker can be formulated by following the classic uh, CIA tri triad in security, which is uh, in, uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability violations. Okay, so in general, the goal of an attacker, not only against machine learning models, but against uh, a system in general, is to cause a difference, can be to cause a different security violation. Um, and the nice <clears throat> idea that these guys from UC Berkeley had in the paper that you see below was to bring, let's say, the standard uh, threat modeling from uh, security engineering and bring it to the machine learning space. So they took these definitions from security engineering and they tried to apply them to the machine learning area. And then they start, you know, by defining these security violations against machine learning models. So, for as far as um, as as far as integrity is concerned, they define an integrity violation 
in terms of misclassifications that do not compromise the normal system operation. So this means that, um, let's say you have uh, a firewall or an authentication system, right? Um, and I am a legitimate user. So I have this face recognition system. I am a legitimate user. Normal system operation means that the system works correctly for legitimate users. So I can access, um, I can be authenticated by this uh, face recognition uh, algorithm, and that's fine for me. An integrity violation means that an attacker can log in into the same system, maybe by using the credential of some other user. So while I, I can still access the system without problem, the integrity of the system is compromised because an attacker has also access potentially to my data. Okay, so that's the definition of an integrity violation. For availability is the opposite. So the goal in this case is to cause the denial of service. So now as the attacker, I don't care in getting into the system, but I want to make the system unavailable for legitimate users. You can think to, I don't know, a web service, you have an e-commerce, and then the attackers uh, do a distributed denial of service on the website, and now the legitimate users cannot access the e-commerce website anymore because it, it's uh, just overwhelmed by requests, by malicious requests. So that's again an availability um, attack, sorry. And uh, in the last case, <coughs> uh, sorry, you have a confidentiality or privacy violation. And in this case, um, the goal is to re re retrieve confidential information, either um, related to the learning model or related to the system users. For example, again, if you have the face recognition system, uh, I would be concerned if an attacker can query the system many times and retrieve my, my face, for instance. So knows that I, I'm working for this specific company or that anyway I'm logged into this system. That's a privacy violation. Okay, so in this case, uh, machine learning models should also um, prevent these kind of attacks, namely that people that are trying to get access to the training data in some uh, fancy way, okay? So that's basically the goal of the attacker. Um, and then we can also model the knowledge that the attacker may have uh, about the target system. And in particular here, uh, you have to consider that to build a system, you need um, to collect training, training data, um, decide a feature representation for your system in case you are using um, not necessarily a deep learning algorithm, for instance. And then you have to pick a learning algorithm. This can be an SVM, a neural network, a random forest, or whatever. And uh, the attacker may have different levels of knowledge about each of these components. For example, for the training set, you may know uh, part of it. Maybe um, in your company, you downloaded uh, ImageNet, so you, you're using part of ImageNet plus some of your data. So in this case, it's um, um, natural to consider that ImageNet as a training set may also be known to the attacker because it's a publicly available data set. Whereas maybe the data that you own as a company is not um, accessible to the attacker. So you can make these um, different ranges of uh, assumptions for training data and similarly for feature representations. So the attacker may know, for example, that my malware detector is using static features. So features that you can extract from the code without actually executing it. But it may not exactly know which kind of features I'm using. For instance, if I'm using a byte histogram or uh, some more complicated representation of my source code. So um, again, here you can make different assumptions on the, on the feature representation. And similarly, you can work on the learning algorithm. Now, one interesting thing is that uh, if you assume that the attacker knows uh, everything about your system, so that he has, uh, how we say, white box access to the system, so he can uh, open the box and look inside, um, then while this case is, is let's say, it's not very realistic in many applications, it, it is still very interesting from the defender perspective because you can test 
the worst case for your system. So assuming that in some very unlikely way, the attacker is anyway able to get to know exactly your system, then what's going to happen? Is it like, with, is the system going to withstand the attack or it is not? And in any case, what's going to be the maximum, you know, the worst performance degradation that they can incur? And this is something you can measure if you make this assumption. And then, of course, you can also relax this assumption to something more realistic. And for example, you can check now if uh, with a more restrictive with more restrictive assumptions on the attacker knowledge, you can still have uh, the same performance degradation or, you know, this is going to give you uh, much better performance because this is also important to understand how far you are from the worst case when you relax the worst case assumption. All right, and so, and, and then depending on, as I said, depending on the assumptions that you make here, you can have uh, white box, uh, gray box or black box attacks. Here there are a bit, you know, conflicting definitions in the literature, also because researchers to get published need to invent something new every time. And most, in most of the cases, they are just renaming stuff. Um, but uh, the, the kind of attacks that we will look into mostly in the course will be either white box or what we call black box transfer attacks or black box query attacks. And I will tell you something more about this uh, later. And then we will clarify uh, the other assumptions case by case, basically. Uh, but if you're interested, you can have a look at the paper that you see below and uh, to the uh, survey that I wrote with, um, with, with, uh, with Professor Rolly, which is called Wild Patterns as this tutorial. So if you Google for wild patterns, you find the paper and you will have a section on uh, knowledge of the attacker where you can find all these different definitions listed there. Okay, so um, in general, um, the, the, a, a good assumption for, for um, let's say, assuming what the attacker knows and typically also what he can do is to uh, not rely on security, what, what uh, is called security by, by obscurity paradigm in the sense that uh, you, can, you should not assume that your system is secure because the attacker doesn't know some of the details of your system. Okay, so that's gonna be uh, broken um, most likely uh, because the attacker is typically able to get to know the important details of the system that can be exploited to uh, bypass detection or to do some other um, kind of attack. So normally you should really make minimal assumptions on what can be um, kept secret from the attacker. But again, typically uh, the best thing would be to, uh, to make different tests. So you start from something which is worst case, so the attacker knows everything, and then you say, okay, now let's assume that, for instance, the training data is not known, the feature representation maybe is only partially known, the learning algorithm could be something different and then you see uh, which is um, what's going to happen to the performance. And, and we will see practical examples of this uh, later on. Now, let me uh, maybe go on with the capability part and then we, we can have a, a, short, a short break. So uh, regarding capability, when you think to what the attacker can change um, related to machine learning, there are mostly two things that can uh, be tampered with. Uh, which are training and test data. So in some cases, the attacker may be able to get access to your training set and inject, you know, malicious samples uh, during the training process. For example, this is the case when you have a system which might be retrained online on data collected during operation. For example, if I have a spam filtering uh, tool and then I retrain it on the emails that I receive uh, over time. Okay, so that's an example where the attacker may inject some samples that aim to compromise the learning process in some way. Okay, this could be uh, poisoning attacks or vector attacks. We will see uh, them uh, later. Or uh, the attacker may only have access to the test samples, which amount to manipulating uh, the malicious samples at test time to cause misclassifications. And here again, you can think to spam emails they are generated by the attacker during operation of the, of the target system, 
and therefore the attacker can change them as, as he likes, essentially. So in the, let's say, more restrictive case, you only have access to the test samples, which are created by the attacker. Um, there are um, some other constraints on this, uh, but, but this is just to give you a short example of a poisoning attack. I don't know if you heard about this case here, but there was uh, a bot um, released on Twitter by Microsoft, and this was called Thai. This was an AI-based chatbot, uh, and the goal was to, you know, uh, entertain uh, people with conversations on Twitter. Um, but, 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 but this tool, uh, basically, um, to engage into conversations, uh, aimed to learn the kind of topic that were uh, put in place by users. And so there was a sort of feedback learning mechanism uh, used by the chatbot to um, be engaged in discussion in, a, in, a, in an effective way. And now, guess what happened? As humans uh, understood that there was this, let's say, feedback mechanism in place, um, which essentially amounted to having the bot um, rephrasing some of the sentences that were stated before by other users. Uh, as soon as people understood that, they, they started exploiting this mechanism, and then uh, uh, they started talk, uh, saying or, or you know, uh, sending the bot um, malicious sentences with racism uh, or, or any gender offense or you know, discriminative uh, text and whatever, uh, as bad as you can think of. And then the bot again started to reply to reply with with these uh, racist uh, and offensive comments. So as you see in the slide, for instance, uh, Hitler was right. I hate the Jews. Okay, so this is uh, um, a very bad example of what can happen. Uh, of course, this was done. I think mostly for um, checking uh, the, the the fact that you can compromise the tool. But anyway, Microsoft was. Uh, essentially obliged to stop, um, to, to remove this bot from Twitter after 16 hours um, that it was operating. So it, it lasted not even a day on, on, uh, on the platform. All right, this is just to give you an example of um, a potentially deliberate poisoning attack. Um, but uh, one thing that um, we should also keep into account is that all this area of uh, adversarial machine learning or machine learning security makes sense because the attacker in most of the cases is not uh, able to change whatever he likes, but he has some constraints. For instance, in the fact that email messages must be readable still by, by humans to convey the spam message to the final user, and malware has to keep you know, his, um, its uh, uh, ability to execute in, in, uh, in environments to exploit the vulnerability. Otherwise, if you evade detection, but the malware sample is no longer effective or does not work anymore, uh, then it's useless because you cannot infect the, the victim machine. And uh, these kind of constraints can be encoded uh, for some simple cases with um, closed form mathematical constraints. In some others, you have to do something more complicated. Um, but typically, when you have the attacker that is assumed to compromise the training set, uh, the constraint is that only a small fraction of the data can be changed by the attacker. And this is um, reasonable in many different applications, for example, for the spam case or for the uh, network traffic monitoring, if you have some tool that is uh, monitoring a network to detect anomalies, typically the attacker is not, not able, cannot be able to control 90% of the traffic. Maybe two or three percent is feasible because it might compromise a machine in the network and then spread some traffic around. Um, so this is a typical assumption that we make when dealing with training time attacks. Uh, for test time, you have uh, constraints on the way you can manipulate samples, um, which amount from application specific constraints that you have uh, in, in the specific domain indeed. Uh, for example, in, uh, in, uh, in spam filtering, you may have a bound on the number of words that can be modified in spam emails. Um, or in malware, you can have uh, 
um, constraints in how you can manipulate samples. For example, you cannot remove instructions from uh, the original source code, but maybe you can inject uh, new instructions that are going to be never executed uh, while the malware is, is running. And uh, now the thing is that, of course, uh, a spanner here might modify 10, 20 or 100 uh, words and you don't have control on that. But the important thing is that if you bound this um, uh, capability, then you have a sort of hyperparameter that you can play with to understand what's happening when you have one uh, word changed in your spam emails, when you change two, when you change 10, and when you change 50. And then you have an idea of how um, gracefully or not the performance degrades. And we will see uh, this example in a moment. Um, now, these constraints typically can be um, translated into constraints in the feature space. So, for example, if you think to the case of spam, right, and uh, where you have binary features, each feature denoting presence or absence of a word, if I want to measure, if I want to control the maximum number of words that I can change, I can have, for example, I can measure the amine distance between these two feature vectors. And then if it's two, it means that two words have been changed uh, between X to the original sample and X prime, which is the uh, manipulated one. So you can basically impose um, some distance, some meaningful distances between samples as a constraint in the feasible in the um, feature space. And what you see here would be your feasible domain. So this box here contains all the emails, ideally, for which you manipulate no more than the max words in each email, starting from X. Okay? And this can be uh, enforced with this uh, norm constraint on the feature vector. Um, all right, uh, I think, uh, let me see. Okay, I can uh, maybe skip this slide because it's doing uh, the same consideration we did before for the knowledge of the attacker. So here again, um, you should not assume that the attacker is either too strong or too weak, but you need to make, um, to consider a whole spectrum of, uh, of possibilities. So attackers that are weaker and attackers that are stronger and see uh, how your system responds to that. Now I will show you how to do this in a more systematic way. But uh, here, let me just point out that um, if you play the role of the attacker, so if you are developing an attack against one system, you may be interested in showing that it works when you know the less about the system, so in, in a black box case. So if you are an attacker, you may want to show that you can break the system even if you know very little about it. Conversely, when you play the defender role, now you, uh, you should not, let's say, um, assume weak attacks, but rather show that your system is robust even in the worst case. Because if it's robust against an attacker which is very powerful, then it's going to be robust also against weaker ones. Okay, so that's maybe the caveat here. And, uh, okay, I think I'm now going to stop for... Um, 10 minutes, and then we can resume from this uh, from this slide. Uh, are there any questions to this point? Um, I have a question regarding um, when we have a when we are detecting spams and we have images in the spam. Mm -hmm. You said that um, uh, we up, if the if the email was classified a lot of time as a spam, we use the hash of the image and we always classify this. Why not instead use the patterns inside the image? Because classifying each image using the hash, it means that you will grow a large database considering how easy it is to modify a bit the images in, in, in spam emails. Yeah, 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 it's a, it's a good point. In, indeed, uh, we did something on this line uh, when developing these class, visual classifiers which were looking at low-level features in the image. So the histogram of colors and all these things. And uh, this is one line of work. The other line of detection was to do uh, something which is called near duplicates detection. So you, you basically have a signature which is not exactly the MD5 of the file. So if you change a bit, it's still, uh, it, it's still robust to this kind of change. Um, so it aims to detect uh, duplicates which are close enough to the original image. So you can have signatures which are 
let's say more robust to these kind of uh, changes. And these uh, these were the main countermeasures in place. But why not apply something similar to what you applied for text, like uh, scoring certain patterns? Because images, like usually, they have capital letters, exclamation marks, or bright colors. Lots of text means they are spam, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, but I think this was um, on the line of having. Uh, I'm not sure I got the difference because I think we did something on this line. When you extract these features, so we had, for example, histogram of colors. Yeah, but I mean pattern inside the images instead of just the, the text features. Because text features, you, you actually uh, afterwards score them as you would do in a text email, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, but yeah. for images, you can... You can use certain measures, like if this image was uh, have a certain percent of text inside, or yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, but but that's what we did exactly. So ah, then okay, okay. we had okay. a bunch of papers on that. Then I mean, we did not use just a linear classifier, but we had also more complex uh, combination of these features. But these patterns that you mentioned are essentially a lot of them. I think we embedded this in the in the approach. Oh, okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, but uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, anyway, it was fun to work on this, like um, 2006, seven. But now it's definitely outdated as a, as a research topic. And yeah, uh, it, it moves fast. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And it was fast. yeah, exactly. And it was uh, also easy because in the let's say in the legitimate emails, you typically have pictures, and then I mean, uh, discriminating separating pictures from these. Um, Artificial images with, you know, few colors and, and many artifacts was quite easy for a classifier. Um, so except for a very few corner cases like uh, legitimate uh, advertisements or these things, uh, the tool was working uh, fairly well. All right, so let's um, reconvene at uh, 11.30 and then uh, I will uh, just conclude this uh, initial part, okay? Thanks a lot. Talk to you soon.
Okay, I think it's uh, time to cover the, the last uh, roughly half an hour. Okay, this one. Okay, can you see the, the screen? I think, yes, you should. Um, so what you see here um, is essentially a taxonomy of all the potential attacks that you can have against uh, machine learning models. This is something we systematized in the paper that you see cited uh, below. Um, so the table contains uh, the two dimensions of goal and capability. And so here you have in, in attacks that violate the integrity of the system while manipulating test data. Okay, so these evasion attacks or adversarial examples are all the examples that I've discussed so far. So the first examples that you have seen in this presentation, they are all uh, evasion attempts where you have one classifier which has been trained before. It's classifying images, for example, and then you are manipulating the pixels of your input image to have it misclassified as something different. So that's the integrity uh, violation when manipulating test data. Throughout the course, you'll see how these other boxes uh, are covered. So you will see that you have poisoning attacks here, backdoor attacks in this case, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, the third axis of the model is the knowledge assumption that you make uh, on what the attacker knows about the system. And as we said, this can be white box. So the attacker may have a white box access to the target system, or he may have gray or black box access. Uh, we will see what these transfer attacks are in a moment. And then he may have a completely black box uh, access, which means you can only send queries to the system. So I can only send samples and observe the outputs, okay? So that's the black box uh, query scenario. All right, so this is something you should keep in mind and it, you will see it uh, coming over and over in the course while we fill in the, the cells. And um, <clears throat> okay, so let's uh, maybe start um, delving a bit deeper into the formulation of ev ev evasion attacks. So what I didn't tell you about the model is that when you establish uh, the goal of the attacker, her knowledge about the system and uh, her ability to manipulate data, um, what you can do is actually formalize a, an optimal attack that the attacker can stage against your system. By optimal, it means that you can write down an optimization problem that you can solve to generate the attack samples. Okay, and then based on these attacks that you generate, you can measure the expected performance of the model on these attacks and see, I don't know, whether the probability of evasion is something like 20 or 90%, which is a big difference. Okay, so again, here, let's maybe uh, replicate the idea of how, how to evade linear classifiers, because then building on that, you see that uh, you can understand, uh, so we, we, we will follow basically the same line of thought uh, that we followed in 2013 when coming up uh, with, with this idea of gradient-based attacks. Um, so again, how do you evade a linear classifier which has uh, been trained before? As we said, for spam, for instance, you have a collection of words, which you see here. So that's the dictionary of words uh, you've seen in the training set. For example, you have, let's say, a thousand emails containing spam and legitimate emails, and then you extract all the words that you have in these emails. So this, this will be your vocabulary built from the training data, okay? And so you have start, bang, blah, blah, blah. That's the whole dictionary of words. This can be hundred thousands, um, million of, of words. Then what you do is you train your classifier on this data. And if it's a linear classifier, this is going to assign a weight to each word. And here we are again assuming that positive means bad. So you have this red uh, color here denoting bad words. The higher the score is, uh, the more uh, the word is retained bad by the classifier. And in blue with negative weights, you have good words. So words which are typically appearing in only in legitimate emails. Okay, then for classification, you have uh, your incoming email. 
um, you basically look which words are present in both the current email and the dictionary. And this is, uh, these are the red words that you see here. So that's going to be the feature vector that you have for uh, representing this email. So now this is how you encode your email into the feature space. And then you see that you have a one for, for words which are present in the email. Uh, words that the classifier knows, of course, so that are in the dictionary. And there is no uh, presence of university and campus in this example. Okay, now if you want to score this email, you just sum up the weight of uh, the present words, because this is um, essentially what happens when you compute the scalar product between X and W. So you do one times two, one times one, one and then you sum up everything. And so if you do this operation, the score is six in this case. Assuming that the threshold is zero, then this is spam, okay? Now, we know that to break these classifiers or to evade detection, the attacker needs to basically lower this score. And you can do this in two, two main ways. One is you can obfuscate bad words, and this is called the bad word obfuscation attack, or you can also inject good words. Um, as we've discussed before. So, for example, if you change the A in start and bang as a four, then what you're going to see is that this word is no longer detected by the filter because it's uh, now a different word for the, for the algorithm. Uh, but still, as humans, we can infer the meaning uh, because by, you know, our, our, our ability, <laughs> we, we still get the main message. Even if you swap the letters, you still you still read it. Um, and then this is a trick. And in this case, you have that the bad words are no longer detected by the filter. So you have zeros here. And you can also add some good words, as you see in this case. And then if you recompute the score, so again, the scalar product between W and X, you have that now the score is minus one. And so this is misclassified. Okay, so this is... Um, a simple way of attacking linear classifiers. You take, you try to delete words that are assigned a positive weight, and you try to inject things which have a negative weight so that you decrease the overall score. But what happens if the classifier is nonlinear? So now in this case, you don't know, um, you no longer know if a specific feature is benign or malicious because you know the the function is nonlinear. so for some emails or some samples a given feature may be associated with a positive influence and for some others it may have a negative influence so it's not quite clear in this case how you should manipulate your sample to evade detection namely to decrease the score okay so uh, at this point now it seems obvious maybe how to solve this but back in time, uh, when we were around 2011-12, this was not obvious at all, up to the point that uh, in some um, security papers, so papers published in uh, top tier security venues like uh, this NDSS, so this is one of the top four uh, computer conferences in security. So it was this problem was not clear at the point that in this paper, the authors, uh, Nedim Chernich and Pavel Laskov uh, wrote the following. So these are some excerpt of sentences taken from this paper. And they said, the most aggressive evasion strategy we could conceive was successful for only a tiny fraction of malicious examples when tested against a nonlinear classifier. Okay, so if the classifier is nonlinear, the worst attack that we were able to device was only effective for a very small fraction of samples. And now what they say is, we don't know why this happens. Okay? We don't have a rigorous mathematical explanation for this uh, surpri surprising robustness levels. Uh, but the intuition that we have, so we conjecture that um, the fact that the model is complex makes it harder to invert for the attacker. So it's now more difficult for the attacker to know how to change things to break in. Okay, so this is basically rephrasing the concept of security by obscurity. Something is complex, you don't understand it, and then 
it should be more secure, right? Uh, and again, they say then eventually that when they were attacking the linear classifier, their attack was uh, very successful. And given that, the robustness of this uh, nonlinear classifier is should be really rooted in in the, in the fact that it's complicated, right? That it's nonlinear. And um, this was what they wrote in the paper. And uh, when I read that, uh, when I read that, I, I thought, okay, this. Uh, is probably wrong. Uh, it, it, it's a, um, a couple of bold sentences which I don't buy, at least. And uh, I was collaborating with both uh, Nedim Shernich and Pavel Laskov because actually I did an internship um, uh, with them in 2011, and we were working on poisoning attacks. But so I knew them uh, personally. We we are in, in very good relationship. And then I I told them, okay. Uh, I think we can break this uh, classifier, and then we did this joint work together. Um, and, and the basic idea here was to formulate the attack as an optimization problem. Because the final goal that you would like to achieve as an attacker is to take this the score of the classifier, which you know is higher for malicious samples and lower for legitimate ones, and you want to decrease it. Okay, so the, the, you can write this as in, in mathematical terms. This is going to be what you see here. You want to minimize the classifier output on a sample x prime. Okay, assuming of course that positive means malicious and negative means legitimate. And so this is what you have, and of course you are bounded by some constraints uh, because, for instance, I want to allow to allow the attacker to only manipulate. 10 words in my spam email, or inject, I don't know, five or 10 elements in the PDF file uh, to obfuscate PDF malware, for instance. So you, are, you have some constraints that ideally can be uh, set as um, mathematical constraints, as you see here in this problem, expressed at the feature level. And now, if you look at this problem, the interesting thing is that uh, this is, of course, a nonlinear constraint optimization problem, but there are a lot of algorithms that can be used to solve this problem. And the, let's say, most famous one is projected gradient descent. Uh, so in this case, what you do is, again, computing the gradient, starting. So you can start from X, which is the input sample. So your original spam email or your initial PDF malware sample, and then you say, okay, now I follow the gradient in feature space, uh, and I gradually manipulate the sample, unless uh, when you hit the constraint, so the gradient would point here, in, it should be perpendicular to these level curves going into the deep blue area, but then since you are constrained, you project it back, which basically here amounts to saying, I have manipulated 10 words, I should manipulate these two more, but instead of, again, manipulating two new words, you replace uh, something in the set of things that you already changed. And so, but basically, this is the mathematical view. Of course, then you need to make uh, some, some changes to take into account that the domain may be discrete and so many other things, but in principle, you can solve this uh, via gradient descent. And the nice thing is that you can do that because uh, the, most of the classifiers have a differentiable uh, output function because they need that to be trained by gradient descent. And so that's the case for subroutine machines, neural networks, and so on and so forth. Um, unfortunately, in 2012 or 13, when we started working on this paper, PyTorch, TensorFlow, nobody of no one of these frameworks uh, were available. And so we could not exploit, you know, the splendors of automatic differentiation. Uh, if you don't know what it is, uh, I can cover it a, a bit later in the next lectures. But uh, this means that we had to compute the gradients um, ourselves and code them in, uh, in, in, uh, in Python, essentially. But here you have an example of um, the, how the gradient looks like for subcorporator machines. Uh, you take the output, which is computed in this way, and you derive it with respect to x, with respect to the input sample, because this is what you need to change to optimize the attack. 
Of course, this is differentiable if this function k, the kernel function, is differentiable, which is the case for most of the kernels. And for neural nets, again, it's, it's something you can compute okay, by backpropagation. That's basically the same rationale. Uh, this is just to show uh, that you actually need to do the math. Um, so that's why you, are, you have been taught uh, how to compute gradients at, uh, at high school, to, to break machine learning models uh, when, you, when you grow up. But um, in, in this paper, we had this example on digits. So we were like showing that um, if you take a digit classifier, so something that uh, recognizes threes and sevens, so you have two class. Now let's say that uh, your three is the attack class, so you, you want to have the three misclassified as a seven. You can actually run this algorithm in a, in a very fairly, um, it's, it's very easy to, to code. And then what you get is something that you see on the right. So it's still looking at three uh, as a three for a human, because only a few pixels have changed, but it's misclassified as a seven by the algorithm. By the, by the linear SVM or the nonlinear SVM in this case. So this was just for testing, but if you want, this is one of, of the first adversarial examples computed with gradient uh, descent before, you know, the popular work by, by Google Brain. And, uh, and then we did the experiment on PDF malware on the same detector that uh, Nedim and Pavel used in their paper and showed that you can actually break it uh, fairly easily. And then this is, um, a very popular paper now, anyway. Um, now, now, one may also argue um, that we cheated in a sense because we assume that the attacker knows everything about the model, right? And so you may say, okay, um, but this is likely, not really likely to happen in practice. In practice, you may have um, adversaries that know less things, less details of your, about your classifier. All right, and that's true. But then what we did in the same paper, uh, this was actually an idea from, uh, from Pavel, was to say, okay, let's relax the assumption that the attacker knows everything. Let's consider an attacker that knows maybe only um, what, how you collect the training data and can probably collect da different data, but from the same source. Um, uh, this is already a good point. And um, imagine, for example, that you can, um, that you want to bypass a spam filter, right? Like Gmail. And what you can do, for instance, is create an email, an account on Gmail and collect emails that you receive or send. And uh, you can also get to know the labels because if you take this data and then uh, look how it's labeled from the filter, then you know whether it's malicious or not uh, from, from the perspective of the filter. If, if an email ends up in the spam folder, then it's labeled as spam by the filter. Otherwise, it's a legitimate email. So you know the labels, so you can query the function you're interested in uh, somehow imitating <laughs> and, and get the labels back, okay? So you can query it. And, and by doing that, so basically now you have a bunch of training points. So you, you, as the attacker, you collect this surrogate training set with labels provided by the target classifier. But then what you can do is essentially create a copy of the target classifier, which uh, we called learn, uh, surrogate classifier. So it's essentially an approximation of the true classifier, which again, you now have white box access to. So the attacker can craft the attacks using looking at the gradients for this function, so for the surrogate classifier, and then try these attacks, so the samples that it, that it generates against the target model F to see if they work. And surprisingly, in most of the cases, um, the attacks are said to transfer from one model to the other as uh, Nicolas Paperno showed in uh, more details in, in his um, um, subsequent papers here. And this is what is called transferability of the attacks. So an attack is able to transfer basically to different models. Okay. Um, now, on, uh, uh, on this I have uh, an example. Uh, let me see, maybe we can cover this fastly, yes. Sorry, I'm getting a lot of 
notification that is tracking. Um, so we tested uh, these um, not only in the paper that I mentioned before, but also on some more recent work on Android malware detection. Uh, so let me spend maybe just a few words on this by saying that uh, I think we still have time, yes. Um, what we did here, so for Android malware detection, um, you, you can think of this problem exactly as we uh, described the spam filtering approach. So what uh, was done in this paper by Daniel Arp and Conrad Rieck and others, again in 2014, so this is Drebin, is a very famous paper on uh, Android malware detection. It was a very simple approach. So they took APK files, which are Android applications, and they, they again built a dictionary of permissions, API calls, what you see here, hardware components, and all these characteristics that you can uh, check into the APK file. And they, so they built this huge list of features. And then um, an APK is basically mapped as a feature vector, whether depending on you uh, is requesting a given permission, for instance, to read messages, short text messages, or using specific API calls uh, to um, um, connect to the operating system. And so based on this representation, you want, so in this case, Essentially, the objects that you see here can be taught as of words. And again, here you have a sparse feature vector, which denotes whether some of these uh, specific permissions, API calls, and so on are present or not. Okay, so you can exactly think at this problem in the same sense we did for the, um, for the, for the text classification problem. And then they have a linear classifier, but you can also have a nonlinear classifier here, whatever you like. And so what we did was to test this um, detector in the perfect knowledge case, so in the white box case, and in the case where you have a surrogate learner. So we created a copy of this classifier trained on a different data set, still sampled from the same collection of applications, but um, and then attacked it and test what happened to the target system, which you don't have access to. So you have the white box case and the black box, let's say transfer case, the transfer attack is on the right. And what you see now is the detection rate on the Y axis. And on the X axis, you see how many features you change uh, to attack your model. So here, this is basically, for example, the number of permissions that I add to my application, or the number of API calls which I add, and so on and so forth. So here I'm just considering addition of features uh, not to compromise the original malware sample. And as you see here, um, this is an example of how we, we increase the attacker capability, right? And what you see is that the model is quite accurate at the beginning, because this is uh, more than 90% with, with less than 1% uh, false positive. Um, so 1% misclassified legitimate applications. But this detection rate drops very quickly, and it uh, is driven to zero by just adding five to 15 objects into my APK file. And now we may say, okay, this is in the white box case. Um, maybe if the attacker knows less about the system, this is much less effective. And it's not like that. Because as you see here, maybe by adding five to 15, I'm not completely evading the classifier with probability one, but I'm getting very close to one after I modified uh, 50 features this time. So at the, you know, if the attacker is able to manipulate more objects into your applications, eventually uh, it will break the system anyway. So the take home uh, messages here, um, and then we stop, are that not only the linear classifiers are uh, very vulnerable to attacks, but also nonlinear classifiers can be really, uh, you know, uh, broken very easily. And the other main message is that you should always evaluate the performance by not just looking at one fixed point here, but trying to understand uh, how these curves that you see here are shaped. So these are called security evaluation curves, and they show basically how the performance drops as the attack strength increases. So as you increase the power of the attacker. Um, and so what you expect here is that if the curve drops more gracefully, then the system is more robust. Uh, whereas, as in this case, if it drops very quickly, 
then the system is not really robust in the, in the worst case. Okay, and in this case, you can build this curve by just playing with this hyperparameter in your problem. So you start by, you know, crafting an attack that manipulates one object, one feature, then you start again from these points and manipulate five, then 15 and so on and so forth. So you release, uh, you relax this constraint more and more as you go. Um, all right, now let me see what I have here. Now this we can cover it uh, tomorrow. Okay, I think I can stop here by, for today. Um, do you have any questions so far? Is everything clear? Did I send you to sleep altogether? <laughs> Okay, okay, thank you. All right, then I think uh, we can keep going uh, uh, with this tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow will be at three, uh, from three to six, and I will be um, finishing this part. And uh, my colleague uh, Luca Demetrio will cover some more details on, uh, on evasion attacks and defenses. And then uh, we will go on with some more details on uh, malware detection and how to break it, to break the corresponding systems. All right, so thanks for uh, following and uh, let's sync back uh, tomorrow. Okay, have a nice day. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 bye.